Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for our live MDA Engage Myotonic Dystrophy Symposium. My name is Nicole Petrowski, and I am MDA's Community Education Specialist. We appreciate you joining us today, and we're glad that you're able to share this important information with you. I also would like to thank our supporter for this event, Avidity Bioscience, and welcome any of their representatives who may be joining us today. We do appreciate your support. And we are committed to community education, and we believe in bringing the community together for opportunities to learn from specialists and having opportunities to connect with others. This event is part of our larger MDA Engage series with disease-specific symposia, which, you are, um, which we are hosting today, community education seminars, and community webinars as well. And I wanted to go over, <clears throat> excuse me, some reminders before we begin today, especially if you weren't able to join us yesterday. We are recording today's event and we will be posting it to MDA.org website for on-demand viewing in a few weeks. For those of you joining the event live, please know that all phone lines have been muted. We will be having Q&A session at the end of each presentation, so please utilize the Q&A icon um, to type in your questions. If you hover over the bottom of your screen, a tray of icons will appear and just click your question to host. You don't need to wait until the presentation is over before submitting questions. Feel free also to use the chat feature during this seminar. If you have any comments, make sure you click on all panelists and attendees when you do type in that comment so all of the attendees on the webinar can um, respond. And then you'll also notice on the agenda there are a few small breaks between some speakers, so please feel free to stay connected to the broadcast during this time, but this will allow you some time to get a bite to eat or grab a drink of water. And this is also the time where I'll be checking the audio for the next presenter, so you will hear us speaking on our end. And then finally, we will be sending out a brief survey after today's um, symposium, and we would like to receive your feedback on what you heard today and yesterday. So we just wanna make sure that we're discussing things that are of interest to you and importance to you. And so your feedback is a way for us to improve future educational events. And we're also gonna be drawing two winners for a um, $20 Amazon e-gift card. So thank you in advance for completing that. And now I would like to introduce our first presenter today, Dr. Matthew Wheeler. He is an assistant professor in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine and adult cardiologist in the Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Diseases at Stanford HealthCare. As an adult heart muscle cardiologist, he cares for adults with myotonic dystrophy, striated myopathies, and cardiomyopathies. He has interests in optimizing screening and management of cardiovascular disease in patients with myotonic dystrophy. In addition, he has research interests that span understanding the basic mechanisms of cardiomyopathies, the use of modern data methods to gain insights from molecular data, and clinical research, including the evaluation of novel therapeutics in cardiomyopathies. So, Dr. Wheeler, I will turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us today. Great, thank you. Uh, and, and thanks everybody for uh, joining us uh, this morning. Um, so we're going to get started here. Um, and then if you're having trouble hearing, just uh, type in the Q&A and we can uh, make sure my audio is working or I'm speaking up. Yes, um, we hear you clearly. Thank you. Excellent. Um, so we're going to talk about the heart and myotonic history today. Um, there we go. Um, so, you know, uh, <clears throat> the heart has uh, uh, many different parts uh, um, together that work uh, uh, to support uh, the rest of the organs in your body. And, you know, neurologists and cardiologists often have this uh, debate as to which organ is more important. And I think the truth is, it's definitely the heart. Um, so, uh, you know, the engine of the heart is, is, uh, has a number of uh, pieces. Um, so uh, you can see on the left the uh, uh, image of, of a heart beating and um, the heart has uh, uh, functions as a pump. Um, it's actually uh, two pumps uh, working in parallel. Um, and then each pump has, has two components, uh, uh, atria or top chamber and a ventricle or, or bottom chamber. And so uh, in a, a structurally normal heart uh, in, uh, in humans, um, the right atrium uh, pumps venous or, or blue blood. 
to the right ventricle, that then goes to the lungs. You breathe. Uh, the lungs uh, get rid of carbon dioxide and, and uh, bring in oxygen. And then that oxygenated or red blood uh, comes into the left atrium and goes to the left ventricle. Okay. Uh, the, the heart, uh, just like uh, your automobile, has a, a fuel supply. Uh, and that fuel supply uh, comes from uh, what's called coronary arteries. So uh, when um, most people, uh, including in the popular press, are talking about uh, heart disease, they're really talking about uh, the coronary artery disease or the heart artery diseases. Uh, and so um, you can have uh, plaque or atherosclerosis, uh, within the arteries that can cause narrowing, blockages, heart attacks, things like that. And unfortunately, um, uh, there's no, not yet a cure for artery disease, but there are uh, many, many treatments for that. And, and artery disease is still very prevalent, um, so uh, very frequently found in uh, patients um, with all types of diseases, and including myotonic dystrophy, and so something that uh, you need to be aware of. Um, and then in, uh, the heart also has an electrical system. Uh, so the electrical system in the heart is sort of uh, shown here in yellow. Um, it starts with the intrinsic pacemaker of the heart, uh, also known as the sinoatrial node. Uh, and then um, conduction comes uh, of, of that pacemaker, paste eat, uh, it's again coming from the intrinsic pacemaker goes to the atrioventricular node and then the signal uh, passes down to the ventricles, again, the, the main pumping chambers and activates uh, the rest of the heart. So this is the electrical system. Um, and then the heart has uh, four, the human heart has four valves. Uh, and these valves uh, basically prevent uh, blood from going backwards and so help uh, keep uh, blood going forward through the circulation. And then uh, importantly, the heart needs to distribute uh, blood to the rest of the body. Uh, and so uh, these blood uh, vessels um, uh, provide blood uh, throughout the body. And so uh, um, in the main uh, blood vessel, the aorta, um, uh, can have uh, some issues that are uh, can be related to um, myotonic dystrophy is not uh, super common. Uh, and then uh, again, you can have artery disease in, in these vessels as well. So this is really for how the rest of the body gets this fuel supply, including the brain and the rest of the organs. Okay, so um, so that's sort of the normal heart and. Um, it turns out that most of the time, uh, 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 most minutes of most days, uh, your heart is doing its job and your body tries, a be tries its best to ignore it. Um, so, uh, you know, if you think about uh, how fast your heart is beating, then uh, potentially you can feel your heart or you can put your hand on your chest and you can feel your heart uh, beating against your uh, chest wall. But uh, most of us try our best not to feel that all the time. Um, I think there's some Edgar Allan Poe about, uh, poem about uh, uh, beating hearts and, and uh, driving people mad. Um, and so, uh, uh, but sometimes the heart does something funny. It can do, uh, just skip a beat. Uh, and, uh, and, that, and that's pretty common. Most people uh, feel skip beats sometime throughout their lifetime. Um, and then it can lead to other symptoms uh, like lightheadedness, chest pain, nausea, uh, intolerance of uh, exertion, shortness of breath, cough, uh, fatigue, or passing out. Now it turns out that almost uh, all uh, symptoms that may be the heart may also not be the heart. And so that's where your uh, friendly neighborhood cardiologist or internist comes into play. Um, in addition to symptoms, um, there can be signs or, or things that can be uh, uh, seen or, or palpated um, of uh, 
uh, changes in the heart. And so uh, we can feel your heartbeat and that can be either slow or fast or irregular. Uh, uh, sometimes abnormal blood pressure is related to the heart or, or changes in the blood vessels. Um, we can hear abnormalities in breath sounds. We can uh, see swelling in the legs, which again can be related to the heart or, or, or not. Um, and then uh, sort of changes in the color or uh, character of the skin. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, physicians, uh, um, including cardiologists, uh, use tests to um, try to expand on these uh, signs and provide more specificity um, to diagnosis. And so um, I'm going to go through kind of three main tests that every patient with myotonic dystrophy uh, should be aware of. So one is uh, the EKG. Um, and this is an example, uh, normal EKG here. Uh, and, and this is also known as the EKG, uh, for those who prefer uh, German uh, spellings of, of their abbreviations, uh, and also known as the 12-lead electrocardiogram. Okay, And so um, the, the leads are referred, referring to the number of directions we're measuring the electrical activity of the heart uh, on the paper. Uh, typically, there's less actual um, mechanical leads as, as shown in the uh, picture here. Okay, um, and then uh, the second uh, common test is called an echocardiogram, and so this is basically an ultrasound of the heart. Um, so same technology used to uh, uh, look at the uterus and and, um, and uh, look at uh, developing fetuses and, and pregnant people, um, we can use that same technology to look at the heart moving uh, in the chest. Um, and so, um, and then uh, the third technology is a rhythm monitor. And so this is uh, three examples of uh, rhythm monitors. Uh, and these are uh, all sort of designed to um, uh, track the electrical activity of, of the heart um, through a period of of longer than a few seconds. And so um, we have a, a variety of devices that uh, record anywhere from uh, 24 hours to 30 days. Um, and uh, oftentimes, uh, I think the emerging standard is the patch monitor shown on the right, which is basically a big band aid that uh, monitors the heart for up to seven or 14 days. Um, and then, uh, you know, your, your cardiologist and, and uh, uh, cardiovascular center has a number of other tests uh, available to um, try to uh, better understand cardiovascular risk. Um, uh, you know, the uh, cholesterol panel or lipid panel, uh, a diabetes test, those are both blood tests. Um, this checking blood pressure is actually, you know, a, a cardiovascular test. Um, and then uh, sleep studies uh, can will also uh, have uh, rhythm monitoring often. Um, and then uh, more advanced cardiac testing like cardiac MRIs, stress testing, and then invasive testing such as electrophysiology study are all things that we not infrequently um, uh, order or review in patients. Uh, okay, so why do we need cardiac testing? Um, it's because uh, there are common manifestations uh, that affect the heart in myotonic dystrophy. And so uh, in order of frequency, those are conduction delay, arrhythmias, and pump dysfunction. Uh, and so we'll go through each of those. Um, so conduction delay uh, can happen anywhere in the electrical system. And so uh, again, we have this intrinsic pacemaker, and that pacemaker initiates um, the heart uh, rate and rhythm uh, throughout the rest of the heart. And so you can have uh, delays or blockages. Uh, we can think of this as having um, you know, problems with the insulation in the wires or uh, sometimes a cut in the wire, um, the wiring system. And, and, uh, and this can impact um, both the efficiency and the regularity of the, the pump. And so um, we can have delay um, uh, at the 
atrioventricular node between the top and bottom chambers, and this can extend uh, the time between the top and bottom chambers pumping. And so the uh, uh, medical term for the, this would be first degree AV block, so it's just a slowing where it takes longer uh, to get from the pacemaker to the pumping chambers. Typically, this is not symptomatic. Um, and then there's secondary AV block where sometimes uh, that connection is, is completely uh, blocked. And so the pacemaker goes, say, uh, two times a minute or three times, a, I'm sorry, two times, a, uh, one time a second or two times a second. And maybe the heart only goes once every other second or once every third second. Um, oftentimes, this uh, secondary AV block can be symptomatic. Uh, so it can feel like skip beats, or if it's persistent uh, for uh, seconds, it can be um, associated with dizziness or, or even passing out in some, some cases, uh, or low blood pressure. Uh, and then there can be complete AV block, where uh, the top chamber is, is and it's the intrinsic pacemaker is going on its own. In the bottom chamber, uh, is going on its own, but there's no connection, okay? Um, and there's, there's other uh, less frequent uh, types of conduction disease that we do see in, in patients with myotonic dystrophy, but this progression from first degree A to second degree to complete AV block uh, is something that uh, um, uh, we, we can see uh, uh, in patients develop uh, typically over the period, uh, a period of years or decades, um, but that is something that um, uh, can be monitored. Uh, in addition, uh, there can be a conduction delay within the electrical system of the bottom chambers or, or ventricles, um, and this can make the, the pump itself less efficient, and so uh, typically uh, with normal conduction, uh, all walls of the heart kind of uh, squeeze and, and, and contract uh, uh, together uh, to eject uh, blood out efficiently. Um, as the conduction uh, delay gets uh, more profound, what can happen is one side of the heart uh, can contract while the other side is waiting, and then the other side uh, starts contracting while the other one's relaxing. And so instead of pushing blood out together, you have sort of this side-to-side -side motion of blood and, and not as much uh, blood pumping out of the heart. Uh, and so we can think of this uh, as uh, because there is sort of a main bundle going to the right side and one to the left, by the right or left bundle uh, branch blocks. Um, and so uh, we don't have any medications um, that uh, reverse or, or slow the progression of conduction delay. Um, this is an area of active research among uh, uh, many people uh, in sort of uh, cardiovascular science, but uh, as, as to date, we don't have any uh, specific treatments for, uh, from a medication perspective. And again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, the degree uh, and severity of conduction delay uh, can be quite different. Uh, and typically, the progression is, is, um, is slow and measured in uh, years or decades in, in most patients. Um, and so if there is significant conduction delay, um, uh, depending on, the, again, the type and severity, um, the uh, treatment of this uh, can be an implanted pacemaker. This is a, uh, two leads uh, from what's called a dual chamber pacemaker seen on x-ray. Uh, and each of these leads has a small uh, uh, screw that connects the uh, lead to the heart uh, and can take over the intrinsic pacemaker function and the intrinsic conduction function of the heart. Um, And then, uh, you know, there's many, many uh, years and decades of experience with pacemakers. And um, generally, the, the procedure of implanting a pacemaker is very well tolerated. 
um, and uh, these devices can last for many years uh, with uh, minimal if any uh, symptoms or side effects. Um, so how common is this? Um, so uh, there's a, a few uh, published registries and I think some of the earlier registries suggested slightly higher lifetime risk um, as we're getting better at diagnosing uh, myoctonic dystrophy uh, at earlier stages of disease. Um, uh, the, actual, the more recent data would suggest uh, lifetime risk may be a bit lower. Um, but uh, importantly, um, this is an age-dependent and severity-dependent uh, phenomenon. So, um, and there are several predictors of significant conduction disease, in, including uh, absolute age, uh, as well as the age of onset. Um, uh, and there does seem to be some correlation, although not a very tight correlation, with severity of muscular disease, uh, size of uh, mutation. And of course, if you have uh, non-significant conduction disease, I've talk, as I've said before, um, you know, there's uh, um, sort of predictable, somewhat, somewhat predictable progression over the period of years or decades. Um, and there's been uh, a few uh, sentinel or, or important studies um, in uh, uh, mainly focused in uh, DM1. Um, there's less direct data in, in DM2, although we see uh, similar findings when we uh, screen uh, DM2. Um, and so uh, uh, we look for sort of these three findings on, on uh, EKG, uh, which is a PR interval or the time between the top and bottom chamber activating. Uh, of uh, around a quarter of a second, and then the QRS interval uh, longer than 120 milliseconds, uh, and then second or three, a third degree AV block, um, or a rhythm other than sinus rhythm on EKG. Um, and then additionally, um, uh, uh, some uh, groups recommend uh, invasive testing to measure uh, conduction intervals uh, within the conduction system uh, to differentiate uh, people who are at sort of uh, a borderline significance um, in terms of whether a continued monitoring is appropriate or uh, if um, moving forward with a pacemaker is appropriate. Um, and then um, in addition uh, to th uh, thinking about conduction, which is really about um, whether signals start originating in the top of the heart, uh, get to the bottom of the heart and, and uh, uh, lead to uh, efficient pumping of the heart appropriately, there are also changes in rhythm. So rhythm, uh, um, when you think about the heart, uh, uh, in most people, um, the rhythm is uh, what we call normal or regular. So essentially one beat every second uh, on a, a sort of metronome that might change depending on what you're doing, increase if you're active, decrease if uh, you're sleeping, um, sort of modulated by that rest and rest or digest system or the fight or flight system uh, that the body has. Um, and there's other things that can impact that like medications and, and uh, things like that. Um, and so uh, there's um, also uh, many different types of arrhythmia. So that's um, uh, ways in which the um, rhythm uh, becomes abnormal. Uh, and so some uh, are benign or with that are not significant, but can cause symptoms. And so this is two examples, a single uh, extra beat from the top chamber of the heart, um, called the APC or PAC or a single extra beat from the bottom chamber of the heart, or PVC. And uh, these can be uh, infrequent and minimally annoying, or they can be quite frequent, uh, up to 15 or 20% of beats. Um, and often that can be uh, cause symptoms or annoyance. But, um, in most cases, that does not uh, pre um, predict 
uh, directly any uh, significant uh, risk. Now, uh, we can also have more sustained changes in rhythm and um, two of the more common uh, arrhythmias um, are atrial arrhythmias called either atrial fibrillation or AFib or atrial flutter. Um, there's uh, um, atrial fibrillation is very prevalent uh, as people get older. So uh, above the age of 80, uh, um, around one in five people will develop atrial fibrillation for the remainder of their lifetime. Uh, and uh, from the best data from myotonic dystrophy patients, it seems like um, there may be uh, um, earlier age of onset of atrial fibrillation on average. Um, uh, and uh, both of these uh, uh, rhythms have uh, a number of uh, treatment strategies, and we'll, we'll go through those uh, in a little bit. Um, and, uh, and also good data that um, um, sort of a, a dual strategy of um, both addressing the rhythm and addressing the major risk of the rhythm appropriate. And so, uh, so we think of um, sort of two components of uh, these uh, more sustained atrial arrhythmias. So one is a risk of, um, of clot formation and stroke. And we treat that uh, uh, typically with uh, thinners and anticoagulation. Um, 20 or 30 years ago, we had only uh, a couple of blood thinners, um, uh, mainly Coumadin um, in the U.S., um, but over the past, or, or, or aspirin for people who we felt uh, were at lower risk of ha for having complications. Um, uh, but more recently, uh, there's a, a, a handful of uh, what's called novel oral anticoagulants, um, like Eliquis um, in the uh, Q&A um, that are uh, both more effective at reducing the risk of clot, the main risk of clots, which is um, the risk of uh, embolic or clot moving stroke, and uh, and while reducing the risk of bleeding that's associated with um, the more traditional anticoagulants. And so uh, uh, patients with myotonic dystrophy who, who've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation uh, are generally recommended to um, be on anticoagulation because of uh, increased risk of the, um, the heart um, not um, being effective in moving uh, blood through, through the heart uh, uh, and not uh, having areas of low blood flow that can contribute to clot and stroke. Um, and there are um, a few other um, approaches uh, for people who can't tolerate anticoagulation um, to try to reduce um, the risk of, of stroke related to atrial arrhythmias. Now, uh, uh, in addition, um, there's uh, two strategies for sort of controlling um, and trying to uh, reduce the time uh, in atrial arrhythmias and also um, symptoms associated with that. And so two strategies are known as rate control, so how fast the heart is going, or rhythm control, trying to get back into a normal rhythm. And, um, there's been debate uh, basically for the last 20 years about which strategy is better. Um, it appears that um, uh, with newer uh, strategies for rhythm control, um, that rhythm control may be uh, preferable in terms of patient symptom um, and, uh, and how you achieve rhythm control can be both through medications or, uh, and through procedures, uh, a procedure known as atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter ablation. Uh, and then in some patients, uh, uh, medications or ablation are, are not sufficient to control uh, rhythm and, and a, a device, uh, basically a pacemaker device, um, along with these are needed to safely uh, treat the rhythm. Um, so atrial arrhythmias um, 
they often are annoying. Um, they can cause symptoms in some. Some people will have these arrhythmias without having symptoms. And, and the main uh, risk is uh, uh, increased risk of stroke. Uh, again, that we try to mitigate. Um, uh, and more dangerous arrhythmias are, are ventricular arrhythmias. And so um, uh, these come in many flavors, but kind of two main flavors are ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Um, these are not as common in uh, myotonic dystrophy patients, but they do occur. Um, and again, in registries, um, somewhere uh, in the two to three percent uh, neighborhood, but there are uh, certain uh, patients and, and uh, patient factors that um, we can find uh, a high uh, risk of, of having these going forward. And like many other things, uh, uh, atrial fibrillation, excuse me, uh, finding short uh, episodes of ventricular tachycardia uh, that may, may not be symptomatic uh, do seem to be predictive of uh, people over the next period of years having longer uh, runs of, of ventricular tachycardia or, or potentially risk of uh, ventricular arrhythmia related sudden death. And so uh, for ventricular arrhythmias, the main concern is uh, the risk of sudden death associated with this. Um, for symptomatic ventricular arrhythmias, um, this is uh, typically a, a medical emergency. So uh, passing out with a ventricular arrhythmia, um, then early uh, evaluation, uh, CPR, uh, um, or automated external defibrillator um, are associated with um, better outcomes. Um, and so oftentimes uh, people who have these arrhythmias um, uh, will pass out if they're sustained, uh, and then um, sort of they, um, typical uh, calling 911 and uh, assessing uh, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, um, and then uh, and going from there. Um, sort of the, uh, in people who are at higher risk, then we can uh, prevent um, uh, sudden death and, and reduce uh, passing out related to these arrhythmias uh, with device placement. Uh, and this is a, a special type of pacemaker, uh, which has both a pacemaker and a, a built-in uh, defibrillation function, uh, also known as an ICD. Um, and these can be uh, um, implanted in the same way that a pacemaker is, uh, and people are found to be uh, at sufficient risk. Um, and in some uh, who have um, uh, episodes uh, of ventricular arrhythmia, we can use medications or, or procedures to try to reduce the risk of having uh, symptoms going forward. Um, and then uh, this is an image of somebody getting defibrillated, which fell off the screen. Um, and so again, uh, there's this uh, um, important paper from uh, Will Grow and colleagues. Um, um, that uh, does show that um, uh, there is uh, a risk of cardiac death in people uh, with uh, myotonic dystrophy type 1 uh, and arrhythmias. Um, and uh, other registry studies have shown that um, uh, sudden cardiac death is a common mode of death in myotonic dystrophy patients. And so up to um, in, in some registries, as high as 30% of patients uh, will have a, a cardiac death event, um, uh, if not uh, true. Um, implanted device. Um, and so uh, the implication of these data is that um, uh, um, we can use device placement uh, to uh, prevent um, uh, sudden cardiac death in patients who are at increased, sufficiently increased risk for arrhythmia. Um, so, so those are the uh, um, more 
prevalent or, or common things that we think about when we as cardiologists are, are treating patients with myotonic dystrophy. Um, less common is um, uh, dysfunction or abnormality of the actual pumping of the heart itself. Um, and so uh, when we do echocardiography or, or MRI uh, of uh, patients' hearts and look at um, you know, sort of the function of the heart, we can find up to uh, one in five who will have uh, some degree of pump dysfunction, so outside of the normal range. Uh, and in some studies, uh, up to another 30% uh, or so who will have subtle uh, findings of, of abnormal abnormalities of the pump, either increased stiffness function or, um, or squeezing function at sort of the lower limits of, of normal. Uh, most patients with pump dysfunction are asymptomatic, and so even uh, patients who have um, a squeezing function or ejection fraction that's um, uh, in a moderate to markedly severe range uh, will not have significant symptoms. Um, part of this is, is due to um, the fact that um, uh, most people have a significant reserve uh, uh, heart function reserved uh, before they become symptomatic, uh, and uh, also because uh, many patients, uh, by the time they have this pump dysfunction, they also have uh, neuromuscular dysfunction that limits exertion or, or exercise tolerance. Um, and when we think about pump dysfunction, um, we also think about um, symptoms of what's called heart failure. Um, and so heart failure is uh, um, described in various ways, but um, the sort of medical uh, uh, definition is uh, when the heart isn't uh, doing what you want it to do. So heart failure may be different uh, for LeBron James uh, than for you know, my 90-year-old uh, aunt uh, in terms of what they want their heart to do to go about their daily uh, activities. Um, so when we uh, see uh, pump dysfunction, uh, and then again, typically this is through echocardiography, um, we think about preventing uh, the symptoms of heart failure. And we think about uh, slowing the progression of uh, worsening of heart dysfunction. And so there are a number of medications, and the, and the number of medications uh, keeps growing. So um, well, there's a number of medications that are known to be highly effective in other etiologies or forms of pump dysfunction. Um, we can uh, we literally double or triple the life expectancy of someone with uh, um, uh, markedly severe uh, pump dysfunction uh, if we get them on uh, uh, multiple medications uh, to support the heart. Um, and importantly, ideally, we, uh, we prevent heart failure uh, by starting medications before symptoms occur uh, at the earlier signs of pump dysfunction. Now, there are uh, treatment effects of uh, many of these medications that limit our use in myotonic dystrophy or limit the dose we can use in myotonic dystrophy. Uh, many patients with myotonic dystrophy have intrinsically lower blood pressures, and uh, most of these medications have some blood pressure lowering effect. Uh, uh, also, our patients uh, tend to have slower average uh, or resting heart rates, and so uh, we're limited in terms of using medications that further slow the heart rate. Uh, and then in patients who have evidence of conduction disease, then using medications that also can slow conduction are, are problematic and can be limited, limiting. And so oftentimes as we're um, trying to uh, treat patients with pump dysfunction, uh, we run into these issues of um, limitations because of the, uh, the conduction disease uh, that often is coincident. Uh, and then there's a, a, a third type of uh, pacemaker called a biventricular pacemaker, which can help reduce pump dysfunction. This has been, again, shown uh, in, in patients who have pump dysfunction and 
in left bundle branch block and other diseases. Uh, and there's some data in, in patients with myotonic dystrophy specifically that this is, is helpful uh, as well. There's um, not as large studies of that, but again, both our experience and, and uh, worldwide experience is, is such that this can reduce bump dysfunction and delay uh, symptoms of heart failure. Um, so we've kind of gone through um, you know, what can happen. And, and so if, if you or your family member is a, a patient with uh, uh, myotonic dystrophy, uh, type one or type two, uh, these are the recommendations. Um, so the recommendations is that um, at diagnosis, you got an electrocardiogram or 12 lead EKG, an echocardiogram or uh, MRI to measure the function of the heart and a rhythm monitor and then have a visit with a cardiologist. And so um, in the uh, pandemic era, uh, many of these things are, are um, things that can be done with, uh, you know, sort of in various settings uh, and oftentimes uh, um, reviewing the results of these uh, data can be done through telehealth or, or, um, you know, or in the doctor's office. Um, and, uh, and we can use these uh, uh, tools to um, sort of assess risk and, and assess the frequency of, of screening for if people who are not symptomatic or don't have high risk um, and, and uh, help you understand um, uh, how your heart is doing. Um, and so we use the ECG uh, to screen for conduction system disease and, and to look for changes in the rhythm. Um, and the recommendation from um, myotonic history guidelines is to undergo annual screening uh, once um, once a person is diagnosed with myotonic history and for both uh, type one and type two. Um, for rhythm monitoring, uh, the recommendations are at least 24 hours of continuous rhythm monitoring uh, with a, with the EKG monitor. Um, this is to evaluate for uh, arrhythmias that may be intermittent. Um, and then the recommendation currently is uh, to do this about every three years. Um, and uh, this is for people who are asymptomatic, so uh, people who have symptoms, whether it's uh, passing out or chest pain or a feeling of sustained heart racing, um, then uh, this could be indicated at sort of any time during life. Um, and then there's recommendations in terms of evaluation of the structure of the heart. Um, and so we, we use resting echocardiogram uh, typically every three years um, to look at the size, thickness, and function of the heart. Um, oftentimes, if uh, abnormalities are seen or if there's changes on the electrical activity and conduction of the heart, um, then we may need to uh, screen more frequently. And again, cardiac MRI in, in some uh, places in the world is actually more uh, cost effective than, than echocardiogram, but um, that's generally not the case in the United States. There's some additional information that cardiac MRI uh, may obtain, but uh, typically we think that is uh, sort of um, not yet um, standard across uh, most centers. Um, and then a, a fourth uh, important component, uh, and this isn't uh, unique to myotonic dystrophy as much as, as um, these other uh, screening, uh, is uh, assessing artery disease risk. And so um, if we look at the world's literature on myotonic dystrophy, there tends to be a, a relative de-emphasis on artery disease risk, but um, uh, most data would suggest that artery disease risk is at least at, uh, similar to um, other people of the same age. Uh, and in uh, some data, uh, there may be even a suggestion of higher risk. And so um, that includes uh, getting uh, lipid panel screening and diabetes screening and blood pressure uh, measurement. Um, these are uh, the first two are blood tests. And then uh, the current recommendations are to treat artery disease risk factors uh, pretty similar to how we do in, in patients without myotonic dystrophy. Um, 
we do use uh, statin medications for high cholesterol, and we have um, uh, do monitor uh, closely for side effects, particularly for uh, muscular side effects. Um, and often we'll start uh, start low and go slow, uh, as these are um, the benefit from these medications accrues over uh, years and decades, not uh, days or weeks. Um, and then uh, we treat uh, diabetes when diagnosed, uh, and there's uh, some information that perhaps we should um, uh, be screening for insulin resistance and, and treating earlier um, to rent side effects. Uh, complications of diabetes. Um, so there's a few open questions uh, in uh, cardiac care, and then I'll, I'll also get to your open questions um, in my talk to this three. Um, and again, so the best approach to treating hyperlipidemia uh, in, in uh, patients who uh, generally uh, uh, do have some uh, skeletal muscle uh, weakness and, and have a potential for even mild uh, skeletal muscle side effects uh, having impact on uh, quality of life. Um, so, so we don't know the answer to that question. Um, what is the best timing for, for uh, thinking about pacemaker or defibrillator implantation? This is something that a lot of uh, research has gone into and um, there's certainly a lot of opinions out there as well in terms of what the best timing is. Um, but ultimately, um, even the best research uh, uh, can't uh, replace a, a shared decision-making model where uh, your physician and, and you and your family uh, talk about risks and benefits and, and fears and, and um, uh, you know, potential uh, um, uh, mitigation of those uh, of those fears, um, and uh, figure out the best timing uh, for everyone. And so, you know, we as uh, cardiologists who treat myotonic dystrophy always have, um, you know, worry about the patients who we find uh, are at high risk and decide not to undergo uh, pacemaker or defibrillator replacement, and then. Um, have sudden death events, and we, no one wants that, and, and so we, you know, we try our best to avoid that. At the same time, um, you know, the pacemakers and defibrillators are not uh, without risk, and so uh, we also um, don't think it's appropriate to put a pacemaker or a defibrillator in absolutely everybody. Uh, and so we have to, you know, be judicious and, and again, uh, work with our electrophysiology colleagues, the, the doctors who put in those pacemakers, and, and with our patients to, uh, again, sort of have a, sh a shared understanding of, of risks and benefit. Um, and then uh, we also um, know that uh, myotonia uh, uh, is, uh, can be quite morbid and can uh, lead to um, significant limitations in uh, quality of life, and so one of the treatments that in the neurology literature has shown to be effective in that uh, is sodium channel blocker, specifically mixilatine. Um, and uh, mixilatine is a drug that we as cardiologists use uh, uh, to treat ventricular arrhythmias, but uh, the studies in the cardiology literature um, suggest that it's a double-edged sword, so it can treat certain arrhythmias, but can make other arrhythmias uh, more morbid. And so I'll show you a little bit of data that we, we worked on uh, to answer if this can be used safely. Um, and there's emerging data as well uh, from others. Um, again, we discussed a bit how, to, how do we assess risk of coronary disease, um, and how do we um, do risk assessment, um, where stress testing has kind of been the standard uh, in patients, and so um, our team at Stanford is, is developing uh, protocols to, um, uh, to do stress testing uh, to help both in risk assessment and physical therapy, and so that's something that hopefully in a couple of years we'll be able to talk to you and, and tell you the results. Um, so I think I'll, I'll uh, pause here and answer some of your questions, and if we have time, I can also um, uh, show you uh, what we've done to uh, 
to address a few of these questions. Um, okay. So I, I can see the Q and A. So maybe I'll just okay. uh, go uh, from the top. So um, Kaylin asks, uh, "What opinion do we have on extended use of Eliquis with metoprolol?" Um, and so uh, we use Eliquis, which is one of the um, novel oral anticoagulants, to uh, reduce stroke risk. And so um, uh, it's one of the best medications uh, for uh, reducing stroke risk with minimal increase in terms of risk of bleeding. Um, so it's a, a type of anticoagulant, so it makes the blood a little bit thinner. Uh, and then, um, but um, in most studies, uh, the risk of bleeding is relatively low. And so once someone is diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, um, uh, in most cases, if, if you haven't had any bleeding episodes, then uh, this is something that uh, one should take indefinitely. And then uh, metoprolol is a, is a beta blocker and it's a, a good uh, medication for rate control. So it slows the rate if, uh, if atrial fibrillation recurs. Uh, and so the main consideration we have uh, for use of beta blockers in myotonic dystrophy is if uh, someone doesn't have a pacemaker, sometimes it can um, uh, bring to the surface um, conduction disease. And so it can, uh, um, so typically if we start metoprolol, then we'll also do a rhythm monitor sooner than we normally would to see if uh, there's any evidence of the heart being slowed uh, to the point where we're getting heart block problems. Um, and then Rebecca asks, um, I have left bundle branch block and what happens if the right goes out and what causes uh, these blockages? So uh, in people with left bundle branch block, um, basically this occurs from scarring down or, or um, replacement of sort of conducting uh, 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 heart muscle fibers uh, into non-conducting. And so it's, it's kind of a, a break in that bundle of tissue. And, and it's, you know, it's not very large. It's like about the thickness of um, a pencil lead. Uh, and it really connects the top, uh, the, the AV node or the, the so the center of the heart uh, to most of the left side of the heart. Um, and so when the left bundle branch goes out, then conduction is slowed through part of the heart, mainly the lateral wall of the left ventricle. Uh, if the right bundle goes out, then that's one of the ways that we get, uh, can get complete heart block. Uh, but in some people they have sort of, um, uh, although it's diagnosed as left bundle branch block. Uh, if we go down and, and look individually, it's actually uh, can be partial uh, bundle branch block. So most people, uh, um, these things happen gradually uh, and um, there is a risk of uh, complete heart block um, with progression. Um, uh, and that's why we think about uh, pacemaker earlier in patients with left bundle branch block uh, in, and myotonic dystrophy. Um, Colin asks, is there a way that implanted pacemakers can fail? Um, and so uh, implanted pacemaker is a device. So just like uh, uh, any other mechanical device, there are ways that it can fail. Um, I would say the most common way is that the battery runs out. And so um, we monitor the device and try to um, replace uh, the battery, um, uh, usually a few months before the battery is going to run out. Again, most um, pacemaker devices, the battery uh, currently lasts between five and 12 years. Um, and then there, there's also leads. Uh, so most of the pacemakers we're currently using have a lead, which is basically a wire that's attached to the heart and then attached to uh, a small box of the pacemaker, which is also known as a generator. Uh, and those wires can fail. And so um, there's a balance between making those wires very thin um, to um, reduce uh, uh, some uh, more chronic uh, complications and making them too thin and having them prone to uh, what's called fracture. And so um, 
those are kind of the, the two main ways. And um, over the course of the, the lifetime of a uh, pacemaker, um, you know, sort of those mechanical problems uh, might occur in sort of single percentage uh, number of patients. And so we monitor those devices and, and um, if necessary, the leads can be replaced, batteries can be replaced, things like that. Um, let's see. Uh, Cynthia asks, uh, what are uh, my thoughts on uh, uh, myotonic patients using an iWatch or a similar device with EKG features for monitoring? Um, and her cardiologist suggested that wearing such a device and send them ECG related results. So, so um, there's a couple different uh, wearable devices that are now FDA approved for monitoring. They're, they're approved for a specific type of monitoring, which is uh, monitoring for atrial fibrillation. Um, and so they definitely don't replace our rhythm monitor, but we think of them as uh, can be an adjunct, particularly for people who have infrequent symptoms. It can help differentiate whether symptoms are sort of single extra beats or atrial fibrillation or uh, um, those sorts of things. Um, they're, not, they're not approved and they're not very good at differentiating top chamber sort of annoying rhythms versus uh, bottom chamber or ventricular dangerous rhythms. Um, and they don't monitor 24-7. Um, so uh, um, the sort of most uh, uh, complete monitoring device um, is it's hard to get that in, in a watch form and, and be able to also charge it. So, um, and, and then the, um, there's other issues in terms of signal and, and things like that uh, that can be limiting depending on how you're moving or, or things like that. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, so the, the Apple Watch uh, is approved by the FDA for uh, AFib monitoring. And then there's other devices like uh, the Cardia device, which uh, is something you can kind of put your thumbs on. Uh, and get a, a single EDKG, and then there's, there's a newer device that does a similar thing. So, um, so yeah, so and, and data is still emerging in terms of how best to integrate these into our clinical care. Uh, Kenya um, asks, my 13-year-old has uh, myotonic dystrophy and very mild conduction delay. How fast or slow does this progress? Will everyone with conduction delay need a pacemaker in the future? So I'll answer the last part first, which is no. Many patients um, uh, with conduction delay will not need a pacemaker. Um, but it's the degree of severity uh, that determines um, uh, pacemaker. And there are thresholds that generally put us in the, we should be thinking about this. And there are thresholds where like most, you know, everybody would generally agree. Um, and in terms of, uh, in terms of the, the first part of your question, you know, I can't speak specifically to, to um, your 13 year old, but um, the progression uh, uh, in the earlier stages uh, tends to be um, slow, but we can see people who year over year have um, sort of dramatic changes and oftentimes if we see that then we'll verify with a, a earlier rhythm monitor. Um, Kathleen asks why people with uh, myotonic dystrophy have low blood pressure. Uh, she is one of those people and um, in my clinic, I would say, uh, you know, low blood pressure is probably uh, in, uh, seen in 80% of our patients. There's, there are some uh, myotonic patients who have high blood pressure. Um, but that it seems to be uh, lower than the general population. Um, there's probably two reasons uh, for this. One is that the, the blood pressure is something that's uh, managed by your um, electrical system. And so the electrical uh, system going to the blood vessels can be impaired just like the electrical system in the heart. Um, and then two is, is that uh, muscle uh, tone uh, can also contribute. And so um, and, and the um, fight or flight system can also contribute. And so those things are also affected. Um, and I think we are at nine o'clock. So um, I apologize to those of you who we haven't uh, gotten to your questions. Um, 
you want to answer one or two more, Dr. Wheeler? Um, let's see. When, when I look through these both um, briefly, um, there are most uh, new pacemakers are MRI compatible. Um, uh, battery uh, duration depends on usage. Um, so that's why we have a big range and then we can, uh, for people who are not pacing a lot, then the, their battery will last longer. Um, if you're starting on Mixeltine, how frequently should EKG per be performed? Um, that's actually an area where there's no um, defined guidelines, but we do recommend um, doing an EKG uh, um, shortly after starting to see if there's any changes from baseline uh, and then um, whether to use rhythm monitoring or EKG periodically is not something that people agree on. Um, and then uh, using statins, so um, you know generally um, we have to weigh risk and benefits, but you know um, statins are very effective at reducing risk from coronary, coronary artery disease and stroke. Uh, and so uh, certainly people who've had artery disease, um, we use statins in them because the risks outweigh the, the or I'm sorry, the benefits outweigh the risks uh, to muscle disease. And then typically we partner with our neuromuscular colleagues to um, sort of have a objective measures so that we can look and see patients been on for a year. Is the progression different than what, what would be expected? So. Um, wireless ICDs, um, their uh, ICDs is still um, in investigation. Wireless pacemakers are now uh, uh, emerging into the clinic. Um, and high triglycerides are common in, in my history, and we do uh, recommend treatment. Um, and the optimal treatment of high triglycerides is something that's emerging as um, probably some new. Uh, medications that are on the horizon for that. Um, and then uh, if you have a pacemaker, then um, typically um, the, we avoid going through medical metal detectors. So I think I'll stop there. Um, I think uh, I thank everybody for, for uh, many of your questions and, uh, and then uh, appreciate uh, everybody taking the time uh, this morning and I hope you all enjoy Dr. Kyle's talk. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wheeler. We appreciate your time today.